Welcome to our gathering where we're going to consider that question, where do we go from here? We've all been looking forward to this conversation a, a great deal uh, because all of us stand at a, a moment of real transition in, in the nation, in the world, and certainly in the New Jersey history community. So after this long COVID interruption, both individuals and organizations are beginning to uh, restart in-person programming and try to figure out that balance of virtual and in-person and then a deal with all of the other issues, some of which were there before COVID, some of which were amplified by COVID, and a few that are actually new. So today in our, in our conversation, um, what we're looking forward to is looking at some of the trends that our wonderful featured speaker is going to share with us at a national level. We're going to share with you also some uh, data that we've gathered at the state level about what's going on in the history community. And then we've invited eight uh, terrific colleagues from around New Jersey to talk about uh, different perspectives of challenges that our history community is facing from a variety of perspectives. Uh, and I, I'm really looking to, uh, forward to hearing from all of them as they, they look at our challenges from many different, uh, as I said, perspectives, whether it's archival, uh, historic house museums, social studies education, and more. So please stay with us for that really important sharing after our featured speaker. And I do want you to think as you hear all of these presentations, but a couple of really important questions. As you listen to some of the data we're gonna share and the challenges that our speakers are gonna identify, um, be thinking about what are some of the challenges that you hear that resonate with you and your institution and your work? Are there challenges or concerns that you're not hearing from some of our speakers uh, this morning? Uh, we'd love to have you uh, add that to our conversation at the end of the presentations. And then finally, at the end, we're gonna think about how we can all work together more effectively to face and conquer some of these challenges as we all move forward. So with all that introduction, um, I, I wanna get to our featured speaker. Um, for those of you who, who are unable to stay with us for the whole program, I also wanna add a plug for our wonderful um, New Jersey Historical Commission programs that you saw in our opening commercial. I hope you'll take advantage of some of those. Our Perfect Partners series that starts later this month is a dynamite opportunity for our museum educators to really dig into the social studies standards and learn about how you can be more effective in connecting with, with schools and teachers. So that's the next big program series that, coming up, that is coming up. Uh, and then there's our, our November conference. So be sure you, you check into some of those uh, programs that we do have coming up that I think uh, should be really uh, exciting and helpful as well. So our, our wonderful speak, featured speaker today is Jennifer Talansky, who is the vice president of the Nonprofit Finance Fund, a, a terrific resource that we at the commission have partnered with in the past and always learn so much from. As the head of the marketing and communications department, Jen helps NFF deliver on its commitment to develop and share accessible resources for the nonprofit sector and to advocate for more equitable practices in how nonprofits are funded. Jen also runs large projects designed to contribute new knowledge about nonprofit finance, including NFF's State of the Nonprofit Sector Survey, a widely cited barometer of the US social sector's financial health, and a partnership with the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco to inform and extend the national conversation about outcomes-oriented social services. Prior to joining NFF, Jen held marketing, branding, and sales roles at Credit Suisse Asset Management, Partnerships for Parks, Hearst Magazine's Brand Development, and J.P. Morgan's Private Client Group. Jen is on the Tri-State Community Advisory Board for the WNET Group and authored a chapter in the U.S. Surgeon General's 2021 report, Community Health and Economic Prosperity. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in English Literature from Duke University and a Master of Science in Social Psychology from the London School of Economics and Political Science. And here, most importantly, she's a mom of two, lives uh, next door to us in New York City, 
And in the rare moments when she's not on mom or work duty, she manages to get in some reading, baking, local volunteering, and Taekwondo. So I hope you share some of that with us too. But Jen, we're delighted to have you. And let me um, also tell everyone that please use our chat section to introduce yourself. We do want this to be very much a community conversation. So use the chat to introduce yourself to each other and do use the Q&A um, uh, function to put your questions in there because we will pause after our initial presentations and take your questions. So make use of both of those resources. And Jen, let me hand it over to you. We're excited to hear about NFF's most recent survey of the nonprofit sector. Um, Sarah, thank you so much. Um, thank you for the lovely introduction and to the Historical Commission for having me today. And um, I should tell you all, I am coming to you from across the river in New York City, but I'm a proud Jersey girl from West Long Branch in Monmouth County. So it is really, um, and I will always be a Jersey girl at heart. So um, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you today. Um, so I'm going to share a presentation with you. Um, and uh, is the presentation up yet? No, not yet, right? Or is it, I'm, I see I'm on spotlight, but um, Nicole, is the presentation up? It yet. Um, um, just what? one second. Okay, great, um, great. Well, so, um, yes, greetings from the Jersey Shore. Yes. <laughs> um, so, um, terrific. So, let me get started. So, um, as Sarah mentioned, um, we are going to talk today about the State of the Nonprofit Sector Survey that we did. And first on the next slide, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about who NFF is. Um, so we are, we're a nonprofit ourselves, um, and um, we, and um, Nicole, if you can go to the next slide, that'd be great. Um, we're a nonprofit. We lend to, we do three core things. We are, we're what's called a CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution, which means we lend um, to nonprofits for real estate and working capital needs. We also provide consulting services for nonprofits with a focus on how money can best support mission. And we are dedicated to advancing the equitable flow of funding in the sector, especially for community-centered organizations, and especially for those led by and serving people of color. Um, finally, we provide accessible insights and advocacy for the sector, and the survey that we're discussing today is part of that. Um, and so on the next slide, um, this is our ninth state of the nonprofit sector survey. We did the first one during the Great Recession in 2009. Um, and why do we do this? We do it because it raises a voice that is so powerful as the collective voice of nonprofits, bringing together voices from organizations across the country in all sectors, large budget, small budget, newer, longer established, BIPOC-led and white-led is one of the ways that we advance change. This data can be so powerful to use. We are stronger and more influential when we're speaking a shared story. And we really do this survey also because it became an advocacy tool, one that we use, one that the media uses, one that we hope nonprofits will use. And, and, and we really want to advocate to those who control the sources of money for the nonprofit sector for what the true needs are of everybody doing the incredible on the ground work that y'all are doing. Um, so um, that is sort of why we do this and I'm excited to be talking to you all today. And um, in terms of the agenda on the, this slide, yep, we are gonna do a quick survey introduction, I'm gonna dig into the data. Um, I'm also, and, and I, I'm aware that um, a lot of folks um, on the call may be from smaller budget organizations. And so we're also going to do a specific look at the experience of smaller budget organizations in the survey, and then how funders can respond to these learnings. So um, on the next slide, um, we focused specifically, we had 1,168 organizations take this from around the country um, of all sizes, sectors. Um, we focused on several things in this year's survey, not surprisingly, um, the impact of the COVID pandemic and how organizations pivoted in response to it and also the impact of the racial reckoning that took place in this country and with focus on racial equity. Um, we'll dig into the details of the many lessons we can take into the future from these recent years. But first, quickly on the next slide, who took the survey? Um, we are very grateful to the 1,168 respondents that took this survey. 
um, who shook off their pandemic fatigue and the survey fatigue that we know many experience to add their voices. Um, I know it's a pain to do all the surveys that come out, but it really is tremendously helpful to have this collective powerful information. Um, the largest, we, we heard from 47 states plus DC, plus Puerto Rico. Um, we heard the largest sectors that we heard from, the human services sector was the largest and arts and culture was the, the next largest. Um, and 69% of the organizations that we heard from primarily or exclusively serve or um, lower people from lower income communities. Um, okay, so what are the key themes we heard? Um, there's really, when times got tough, everybody turned to nonprofits. Nonprofits were really on the front lines during this pandemic. Um, and there was a lot of nimbleness and innovation we saw. People who choose to work for various nonprofits do so because they care about the causes they're supporting. And so we saw a lot of that heart and sweat equity um, in how nonprofits responded to these very, very challenging years. Um, the events in the last two years also accelerated a racial reckoning in this country. Um, George Floyd's murder, Breonna Taylor's murder, and unfortunately the murder of so many other innocent Black Americans, sparked widespread calls for social justice. Um, the anti-Asian attacks in places like Atlanta and San Francisco ignited the Stop Asian Hate Movement. Nonprofits were on the front lines of that as well, of the move for greater racial equity um, and restorative justice, as well as on the COVID response. Um, we also saw that BIPOC-led organizations are deeply connected to communities' aspirations and needs, and they need to be supported in a way that overcomes some of the systemic racism in the nonprofit funding sector. Um, okay, so now let's dig into the data, okay? So first off, this was a moment of relative financial strength. And let me say, I know, and this is a spoiler alert, we're gonna to touch on this later, it was not a moment of financial strength for everyone, um, especially for small budget organizations, those under $100,000 in um, uh, annual expenses. We did see though in the survey, when we looked at all respondents, all 1168, um, what you see here on this chart are all of the years that we have conducted the survey. And this was by far the um, year where the orange line reflects the percentage of organizations reporting a surplus among the survey respondents. And the, the um, purple line reflects those reporting a deficit, gray is break even. And you can see, and we were surprised to see this, that um, in 2021, in this most recent survey, we saw the highest percentage of surpluses among respondents that we had seen in all the surveys that we've been running. Okay. And on the next slide, um, we see that 45% of respondents had six or more months of cash on hand. Again, we, you know, who've been doing this survey for many years found this surprising. Um, but I do want to emphasize again, relative strength. One, we, there is likely a survivor bias in who responded to the survey. We have no way to capture the response from nonprofits who closed their doors. Um, and while it is wonderful to see 45% with a strong cash, cash position, there are also a quarter, 24%, uh, with 60 days or less of cash on hand. That means if revenue ran dry and expenses stayed the same, they still had to pay salary, rent, et cetera, they would have to close their door within two months. That is, that is not a fun way to um, lead an organization. It's precarious and stressful. Um, so how did this moment though of relative, and this on relative strength happen? Um, Funders responded to this critical moment for nonprofits and communities. On the next slide, we see some of what happened. 71% of recipients um, of respondents received one or more PPP loans. 36%, and again, this astonished us, um, received half or more of their fiscal year 2021 funding as unrestricted. Unrestricted funding is the, um, is the grand prize for many nonprofits and it's, we've heard for years that they do not get, that nonprofits get very little unrestricted funding. This year was different. Um, and over half said that funders have been more flexible with use of funds since March, 2020. Funders have unrestricted funding. They've loosened 
um, reporting restrictions. They have loosened the timeline on spending some of this money. There's been greater flexibility as everybody recognized this is a moment of crisis. And on the next slide, um, so when the pandemic began, there were widespread fears that the nonprofit sector would be overwhelmed and underfunded. Um, and for some, that was the case. We were surprised to see that 70% of nonprofits said their current level of funding is actually higher than it was before the pandemic in 2019. And that for a third of nonprofits, their current level of funding is significantly higher, 10% or more. At the same time, one in five nonprofits is in worse shape now than they were in 2019. This is not an insignificant number. Um, and again, we have to keep in mind the survivorship bias. Um, many nonprofits directly attributed this increase in funding to the pandemic. Two thirds said their overall funding increased as a result of funder response to COVID. So what was the result of this? The result of this was that some nonprofits had the resources and flexibility to respond to true changing community needs. There was innovation, adaptation, a drive to keep serving, nonprofits made sacrifices to do so, as you'll see in some of the comments that we have later in the presentation. They were creative, passionate, dedicated. They relied a lot on volunteers and on sweat equity. Okay. So what did we see nonprofits do during this really challenging time? We saw 71% had an increase in service demand. What they were offering was in great need during this time. Half of nonprofits said that staff took on duties outside of their job descriptions all or most of the time. We saw organizations pivot. For instance, there's one literacy organization we saw that switched to delivering um, food supplies, PPE, diapers, other needs for young children. 88% um, of organizations developed new or improved ways of working and half expect these changes to become permanent. 62% Despite that we were all shut down, 62% expanded programs or services. And in the next slide, you see some of the examples of this. Um, and, and, and let me just say, I'm going to um, share this presentation with everybody afterwards. So I won't read all of the quotes, but you will have them and, and can read them at your leisure. Um, what we see on here, though, are two things. One, I think we see the power of flexibility and funding. The first quote is about an organization that provides support for um, new moms with um, infant child development, and they always did home visits. Um, and when COVID struck, they couldn't do home visits. And so what they did, because they funder unrestricted their funding, which let them respond to true needs, as opposed to what anybody thought was the need, you know, a year before COVID, when none of us could envision what happened, um, they were able to redirect some of those unrestricted funds to purchase strollers for the families. Um, and then they started doing their home visits outside, which had an amazing positive benefit. The families got a new stroller, everybody got exercise and fresh air, and it's something they're actually planning to continue. Um, and we also saw a lot of organizations switching to Zoom. And one of the things that we heard was that it allowed folks to reach new audiences and to allow their workforce greater flexibility. And there was one organization that talked about how um, with Zoom and with doing so much virtual programming, their audience size was actually larger than it was pre-pandemic in person. At the same time, longstanding financial concerns were made. Um, this was a moment, right? And during this moment, many the funders, individual donors, to the extent that they could, government recognized that nonprofits were on the front lines um, for our physical and mental well-being and they made flexible and unrestricted funding available to support these. Um, however, um, despite these recent, this recent moment of improvement for some nonprofits, nonprofits are not taking this current situation for granted. And unfortunately, we are seeing some of the funding. One, we're seeing some of that funding dry up, as I'm sure you all know. And two, we are seeing um, some of these practices, we're seeing folks revert on some of these practices, not giving unrestricted um, we even saw one funder that works with um, small arts organizations had unrestricted funding and then restricted the same funding that was unrestricted um, in the second year of the pandemic and really sent these organizations scrambling to manage that. Um, so folks aren't taking these recent gains for granted and achieving long-term financial sustainability, funds that cover your full costs 
and unrestricted revenue are still top concerns for um, organizations. And familiar challenges in terms of staff, um, employing enough staff, offering competitive pay, and staff burnout um, were the highest, um, uh, the highest responses when we asked folks about what are your top three staff challenges. Again, I suspect these are things that you all can relate to. And then towards the end of the pandemic, when we did this survey, inflation was starting, but inflation became a huge concern on top of all of this. Um, and so I'll just read you one quote. Due to the 7% rise in inflation in America, the board of my organization projects that it will be struggling to meet our fundraising goals and financing non-necessities in the year 2023. I will try to campaign for loans from the state and city and corporations. So while many organizations did financially well during the first two pandemic years, that wasn't the case for all. And on the next slide, you can see inequitable funding persists. With respect to PPP loans, payroll protection program loans, 76% of white-led organizations received PPP loans compared to 58% of black-led organizations. This may be due to two factors. Fewer black-led organizations applied for PPP loans, and among those that did apply, 99% of white-led organizations received them versus 90% of black-led organizations. One of the contributors um, to the current financial situation of nonprofits was the amount of unrestricted funding provided, as we talked about before. Um, and overall, 36% of organizations received a really surprising 50% or more of their funding as unrestricted in fiscal year 2021. But there's an important racial gap in the data that needs to be highlighted, namely that just 26% of BIPOC-led organizations said that half or more of their funding was unrestricted compared to 41% of white-led organizations. And this is a finding that held up even when we controlled for other factors, such as organization size, location, focus area, um, and whether the organization focuses mostly on serving the needs of people with lower income. We also saw inequitable funding persist in the sources of revenue. And I think we, um, if you can go back one slide, Nicole. Um, there, the, there are, thank you. Um, so um, white-led organizations, these we asked about, did you receive funding from these sources? And white-led organizations were more likely than BIPOC-led organizations to receive funding from each of the nine revenue sources that we listed. Um, particularly of note is the difference in corporate donations, um, in federal funding, not including PPP, exclusive of PPP, sales and investment income. Um, so this is part of what we need to correct in the sector as well. So, I know that a lot of the audience is from small budget organizations, and so I wanted to do a specific analysis looking at that. Um, and unfortunately, small budget organizations did not have the same positive financial experience. Um, small budget organizations, those with annual expenses of less than 100,000, the opposite was true. Um, we had 137 organizations in our sample that were um, under 100K or under, and they were half as likely as all the respondents to see funding levels go up during the two years of the pandemic, half as likely to have finished the year with a surplus, three times as likely to have seen their reserve funds decline, less likely to have received PPP, and less likely to have received one-time COVID funding. What caused this difference? On the next slide, um, many factors. Um, one, very small organizations are less likely to have diversified sources of funding. Just as a few examples, um, only 10% received federal funding in 21 compared to 46 for all other nonprofits. Um, foundation funding, there was really a discrepancy in, in, in all of the um, kinds of funding, um, except for on individual donors. 88% received of small nonprofits, small budget nonprofits received support from individual donors in 2021, which is the same percentage as for the sample as a whole. Um, funders were less likely to increase their levels of support during the pandemic. Um, just 8% increased, uh, received increased support from the federal government, 
27 from foundations and 15 from corporate donors versus uh, much higher percentages for the rest of the population in our um, survey respondents. Um, and most did not apply for PPP loans. 76% did not apply for PPP loans. Um, okay, and then on the next slide, what is the impact of this? Um, when you don't have the financial support to do what you need to do, it has an impact. So these organizations were less able to increase staff, pay, um, expand programs, um, et cetera. So it, it, they did not have the support that they needed to do the things that they wanted. At the same time, I really want to point to the resilience, the heart we saw from these very small budget organizations. And on the next slide, you can see a few of the quotes. And uh, these are really reflective of a lot of what we saw in the qualitative answers. Um, one organization, when we asked, what are you most proud of, said they're most proud of surviving, keeping our building that we own open and safe, sharing our space with others who do not have a space to do their creative work, creating a new website, online fundraiser, new choreography from the pandemic experience. We saw a lot of organizations also talking about the, 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 the silver lining of um, virtual programming, um, which allowed them to reach uh, new audiences and create greater access. How can funders respond? They can practice trust-based philanthropy. And if we go to the first to the next slide, we really want to encourage funders to do all of the things that the um, pandemic instigated and acceler accelerated. Keep giving flexible funding. Understand and fund full cost for organizations. And for those of you seeking funding, when you think about your full cost, it's 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 not just the short term need either on the general operating support side or on the program side. It is also thinking about your infrastructure, thinking about investments in the future. What do you need? What are the full costs? of maintaining your facility, um, depreciation. Um, what are your anticipated needs for covering facility uh, costs? Um, fund operations, we saw that a lot. These are the things that are hard to get funding for. Um, and fund organizations to have a surplus of rainy day fund. Don't punish organizations because they managed to put a little bit of money away. Can you imagine if anybody did that in the corporate world? And fund at levels that let nonprofits pay living wages to all staff. We have many organizations that are serving people with lower incomes and their staff are suffering from many of the same challenges that the clients are suffering from. That feels unacceptable um, that, or that staff are not um, paid a living wage and it is due to how they're funded. And the, the, other, um, the other just quick point I wanna make on that is I feel like we have a proof statement from this period that we haven't had before at a widespread level, that doing this worked and let organizations show up with the heart um, that, and, and passion and nimbleness that they needed to really serve their communities. And the inequitable funding system has to change. Um, and we really wanna encourage everybody to be part of the solution. Um, we encourage funders to go beyond their usual networks um, pay particular attention to BIPOC-led community-centered organizations that may have been excluded from traditional funding pathways that may not have been part of your um, original traditional network. Um, let nonprofits in the community have a say in who's getting funded and in the shape of programs. The people who are on the ground best know what are the um, solutions, what are the programs that are needed to help communities reach their aspirations. Um, and really share, share from yourself, share from your network, share your advice, um, be a resource when you can get funding and even when you can't, can't get funding. So I will just end by, um, with this on the last slide is a um, wonderful quote from a nonprofit um, about, with a message to funders. Um, and so I will just read the first line, trust us. Trust us, trust us. We are the experts in our work. We need multi-year unrestricted funds. We are looking for partnership, not oversight. And that is it. My thanks to you all, and I look forward to your questions.